my great privilege to welcome you to one of our lunch seminars that's sponsored by the Center for Global Christianity. We've got a wonderful speaker today who, alas, it's so, these are some of his penultimate words, which is, which is to say Professor Thomas Tagaraj is going to be retiring very soon and has graciously agreed to give us a lecture and discussion on living and working with world Christianity, how my mind has changed. The very topic, how my mind has changed, implies that somebody has been doing something for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Professor Tom Raj has been teaching the subject of world Christianity since 1988. So he's got a couple of decades to reflect upon a changing field and his own place in it. Professor Thomas M. Thomas Tangaraj retired in 2008 as Professor Emeritus of World Christianity at the Candler School of Theology. And he has been very gracious in teaching here one semester a year for the last five years or so. Hard to believe how quickly time has passed. He's a, he's a specialist in interreligious dialogue and is very heavily involved, has been heavily involved in major discussions around that topic. He has published both widely, widely in English and in Tamil. And he, in some, the titles of some of his books are The Crucified Brewer, An Experiment in Cross-Cultural Christology, Relating to People of Other Religions, What Every Christian Needs to Know, The Common Task, The Theology of Christian Mission. And here is a recent book that he uh, graciously gave me, where, which he edited, entitled Discipleship and Dialogue, New Frontiers in Interfaith Engagement. And I'll pass this around so that people can, can see it. Apart from his academic interest, Professor Tagaraj is interested in South Indian music. He's an accomplished hymnologist, and 20 of his hymns are now incorporated in the official hymn book of churches in Tamil Nadu. And we've been graced by his leadership in chapel here at the School of Theology over the last few years where we've been able to sing some of the Tamil hymns. I also want to thank Dr. Tanaraj for participating in the IMAC committee for the, for the last five years. He's participated in the BTI International Mission and Ecumenism Committee. And so he's he, uh, even though he's been just a technically visiting professor, he's gone way out of his way to participate fully in the life of school, including sitting on dissertation committees and doing all of his things over, beyond, and above the call of duty, you could say. So we're going to miss you very much. And we're just so grateful that you're taking the time to speak to us today. So let's welcome Professor Thomas. Friends, I'm delighted to be here, and this is a rare privilege and honor for me to be able to reflect on my career as a world Christianity teacher and share that with you. And I decided to do it in the most informal manner. So there are no footnotes, no big quotations, just my reflections on what has gone on. So be patient with me. Um, and I'm extremely thankful to Dana Robert uh, for asking me to do this. This was our original plan to do one at least lecture on world Christianity. And uh, then another one came along, which is happening next week, which is on a much broader topic of theology and theology and education. But today I just want to talk about living and working with world Christianity. And uh, this topic is such good to have some pictures. That's why I'm using PowerPoint uh, instead of uh, reading a paper or anything like that. Now, <clears throat> I need to tell you right away that I have always been living with World Christian. When I was born, Bishop Stephen Neal was the bishop of our diocese. <laughs> And my father had been his student in the theology school. And my father was a minister. So I knew the world was bigger 
even when I was born. Christianity was not only in India, it was in Britain too. <laughs> <laughs> then, uh, this was when I was born, Steve O'Neill was there. Then when I was two years old, he left for reasons uh, which we don't need to talk about. He left our diocese, went back to Britain, and became one of the leading missiologists of the last century. I mean, his books, his writings are most valuable. And then came the next bishop, Bishop Selvin. He was a British recruit, a wonderful, fatherly, gentle human being whom I had known. Uh, because he was my bishop. When I began to know who I was and what I was in the church, so he, I had known, I had talked to him uh, in my own double and his own little double he knew. So we have had conversations. And I especially remember the little church where I was when I was uh, five years old to nine years old. And I was in the church choir. There is one incident I remember about Bishop Selvey. We had our church renovated and built anew, and the bishop came to inaugurate or the dedicate the new church. And I was a member of the choir as a nine-year-old boy, and we sang Western hymns in Tamil language in our churches. And that celebration, the last hymn for the recession, was crown him Lord of all. That hymn. In Tamil, of course. So we were singing to the tune of Diadem, which is So that we were singing in four part harmony. It was a choir of boys and men. We didn't believe in women being part of the choir. Uh, so only boys and men, we sang in four parts and processed out of the church, back to the church. And then, uh, halfway through the procession, the organ collapsed. The bellows fell. So we had to sing a cappella. <laughs> so we sang in both parts harmony a cappella and finished. And Bishop Selvin came up to the choir and thanked us profusely that we sang so beautifully without the help of the organ. So I still remember the day when he came up and told us that. Then I, my father was transferred around the town where uh, he came as a bishop to visit. And if we had our custom in our country to receive the bishops two miles ahead of the town. So a large group of people would go out of the town two miles away and meet the bishop as he comes in his car and uh, open the whole, you know, those days they had these old fashioned cars where they can take the top off and the bishop is sitting there and the band playing and people singing, we bring him to the top. So I remember going as a, a ten year old, uh, going in that uh, procession to meet the bishop. And he knew that I was the pastor's son. Because my father was my, our minister. So as I was walking by the side of the car, Bishop Selwyn recognized me. And he said, hey, come on. And so I sat next to him in the car. <laughs> in our session. I still remember that Bishop Selwyn doing that. So I was living with world Christianity as a little boy and as a young man and as a minister. I had uh, British colleagues I knew. So that was a reality for me. When I moved to teach in the Tamil Nadu Theological Seminary in Madurai, which is in South India, there again I was living with world Christianity. Here is the picture of the faculty in 1972. And you can see, I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> And there is one other person connected to this place, David Potirajiru, who did his PhD here in Boston University School of Theology. And, uh, and then uh, you have uh, Bjorn Fiester from Sweden, Bill Harris 
from England, Anita D. from Sweden, and Charlie Ryerson, who used to teach in Princeton. So I knew I was in a world Christianity right there. So we had several others over the years too, people from different countries teaching along with us. And of course, this was a first set. So all these are students, and all these are faculty. This is a student. This is a faculty. <coughs> That's a student. The rest are all faculty. So I should say that I was living with World Christianity to start. Mm -hmm. But then, working with World Christianity, that's a different story. So that started only when I came to Campbell School of Theology, Yemen University, as a professor of World Christianity. And it was uh, the school as it appeared those days. If you go now, it's totally different scene. A totally new building. I can't recognize it. I don't think it is my school anymore. There was a lovely building called Bishop's Hall that was demolished. And a new, beautiful building has come, but I cannot avoid it. This is not my school. Here is the old school where I got for 20 years. And it happened because there was one Mr. T.W. Brooks, a businessman, in uh, Atlanta, who was a generous donor to the Kansas School of Theology. And in his name, the chair on World Christianity was established. And I was the first one to come and occupy it. And uh, Jim Waits was the dean at that time. He was the one who gave the official invitation to me to come and teach. But interestingly, the original advertisement about the job, did not have the phrase for Christianity. It was advertised as a position in world mission and ecumenism. And the mandate was this in the advertisement. Should be able to interpret the experience of and development in the churches outside the United States to the churches in the United States, historically, theologically, and culturally should have experience with churches outside the United States and with the American nation. When I read that definition, I thought, I can do that. <laughs> Historically, a little bit. Theologically, definitely. Culturally, sure, with my songs. So I said, I can do that. And I applied, I came. So I came as a professor of world mission and many songs. But something happened after I arrived. We had conversations, and suddenly I became professor of world Christianity. Where did that word came from? I do not know exactly, but there were stories of that phrase being used in memory by earlier speakers. And there were writings <coughs> on world Christianity. Scott uh, Lazarus himself <coughs> had used that phrase. And in the World Council of Churches, they had used that phrase, World Christianity. So the phrase was not unfamiliar, but it was not seen that way. But it was very clear <coughs> to all those who organized that chair that World Christianity meant World Mission and Ecumenism. That was clear. So that's how they understood that I became that. But of course, anytime anybody uttered the word world, everybody looked at me. Hmm. It was very clear in the faculty meeting. Any time the word international comes, everybody looks at Tom. Yeah. <laughs> As if I was in charge of the world. And I even believed it. So I used to introduce myself to the prospective students of the new students. I am the professor of whom people think he's got the whole world in his hands. <laughs> so that's, uh, I think I have to believe it myself. But then, I have to ask myself, what is World Christianity? Because it's an awkward phrase. English has this awkward phrase. Mm -hmm. You know, coffee table, what do you mean? A table for coffee? Uh -huh. Dialogue partner. Partner in dialogue? 
world Christianity, worldwide Christianity, or adverbially worldly Christianity. You can say whatever you want to say. That's good norm together. So I have to decide in terms of how I, how I would pass it, how I would understand it. So I used this method. I told myself what it is not. One thing clear to me was it is not world church. Because we don't have church in the world. We have churches in the world. Even when the World Council of Churches was formed in 1948, they had to have a clear document which told everybody that they are not a supra church or a super church. It's a council of churches in the plural. So we are not thinking of a world church, even though there are some among us who might claim there's to be the world church. But true in the sense of worldwide church. The Presbyterians are all over the place. The Congregationalists are all over the place. The Roman Catholics are, the Eastern Orthodox are, in that sense. There is a world church, worldwide church. But we have only churches. So I had made clear of that. The second one I avoided, not Christendom. Now the word Christendom has very positive meaning in Europe. In European languages, Christendom doesn't mean what we mean in the English. In the English language, by Christendom, we have a negative view of a territorial Christianity, which is dominant, controlling. That's the picture. The Holy Roman Empire almost becomes our understanding of the word Christendom. So that's not what I'm dealing with. So I'm dealing with world Christianity, which is not Christendom. So that was created. Then I had to ask myself, what on earth are we talking about? Because, so I had to think of world Christianity as one of the many religions which has worldwide presence. And Diana Roberts is right on target when she writes a book on Christian mission, how Christianity had become a world religion. Yes, it is one religion among the many, which has its worldwide presence. So it talks both about its scope and its position. It has the scope of being worldwide, its position as one of the religions, not the one, one of the religions in the world. So that became my way of understanding it. But it is a very formal definition, as you can see. There's not much content to it. So I need to find a way by which I can bring content to it, material content to this idea of world Christianity. So I went about asking myself, what is world Christianity? And I came up with four aspects. This is why one may say my mind has changed in the four ways of looking at it. My mind has worked through, what am I dealing with? You know, there is no discipline called world Christianity, as clearly discipline like systematic theology, church history, things like that. So I had to ask myself, what to say? So the four ways of looking at that helped me a lot. The first one, world Christianity, is a historical hermeneutic. It is a hermeneutic to do history. A way of doing history is what I would say. It involves first recognizing that all local forms of Christianity are local expressions of Christian faith. Now this may sound redundant almost, but the point is Christianity is available only in local forms. in no other form. So the local forms are the expressions of the Christian faith. Now this came to me powerfully two years after I came to Canada. I took a group of students to India. And I took them to my hometown. <coughs> my hometown is Nazareth, most of you know that. 
in South India. And that's the church in my hometown. Mm -hmm. And I grew up as a theologian who always criticized my church for being Western. We need to be more Indian. We are true Western. So that was the standard rhetoric most theologians had, and I was born out there. But then when I took my American students to Nazareth, and we went to the church for the evening worship. So we went in. <coughs> As I stood there, I suddenly realized my church was not Western. <laughs> There is one church which may look a little bit better <laughs> with its pillars, its Roman architecture, with its high altar, <coughs> but there are no pews. And I sat there with my students. I saw people coming in, kneeling on the stone floor and praying and then sitting down on the floor. I said, this is my church. Mm -hmm. I didn't see that in Atlanta. All the talk about my church being Western, what a mistake I was making. I didn't see this church in Atlanta anywhere. This is only available in Nazareth. So all local forms of Christianity are local expressions of the Christian faith. That's the first rule for my heavenly. The second one, that because of that, all local expressions are relativized. No expression can be made as the benchmark. So very often, we take one form of Christianity and make it as the benchmark to measure whether others are really Christian or not. So when I stand in Nazareth, I know I'm dealing with a form of Christianity which need not be judged by the form of Christianity I know in Atlanta or in Boston. All local forms of Christian expressions are relativized. None can operate as a benchmark. That's a humanity I learned. The third one, because of that, all the local forms of Christianity can be revitalized when there is interaction between these local expressions. So my American students are enriched because their local expression of Christian faith is now in interaction with the local expression of Christian faith in Nazareth. So in that interaction, there is a revitalization of Christian faith. So historical hermeneutic involves recognizing the local forms, relativizing them, and revitalizing them in mutual interaction. But of course, that doesn't mean Christianity is all different, all gone in, you know, in different directions. There's something common about them. What makes it one world Christianity is that it's all linked to what I call Christian bhakti. <coughs> bhakti is a Hindu term which of course we Christians use all the time, which means devotion, attachment to God, or attachment to anything. <coughs> and I talk about Krishna Bhakti, devotion to Christ, <coughs> and that which binds all these local forms together. <coughs> and the devotion can be expressed in all kinds of ways, not in the same way. So that formal category <coughs> of Christu Bhakti that keeps world Christianity as one world Christianity. Number two, world Christianity is also a missiological matrix. World Christianity offers us a new matrix on which we can construct our understanding of Christian mission. For a long time, this has been our understanding. <coughs> It's always from here to there. So even when I come here, it will be seen as some people reverse mission. Because mission is one way. So if somebody comes as a missionary to the United States, that's a reverse mission. No. 
that world Christianity gives you a way of changing that method. It is more like what I know in Atlanta. <coughs> called, uh, you know, name of that place is Spaghetti Junction. Spaghetti Junction. Vision happens in Spaghetti Junction. It happens in all directions. It is not one way. Nobody can put a sign, no two ways. There are many ways. So it gives you a different message to work on mission, the task of mission, the purpose of mission, the procedures in mission. This also means two moves are involved. The hereafter mission will not be linked only to the apostolic character of the church. Because very often the word mission, which means being sent, is attached to the word apostle, apostle, one who is sent. So the sentness of the church becomes the matrix within which one thinks about mission. But if we believe in the spaghetti junction, then we are talking about the Catholic character of the church as the place for mission. Because there are there is a presence of Christian communities all over the world. Of course there are some places, it may not be. But in most places, there is a church. Or there are churches. So mission never happens just being sent, but actually experiencing Catholic hospitality. Mission is an expression of Catholic hospitality. That my being here, you being there, it's all expressions that we belong to a Catholic church, a universal church, where race and gender and language can never be values. So we have to plant now our mission talk in the Catholic character of the church rather than the apostolic character of the church. The second one I think of, we move from evangelistic announcement to dialogical engagement. But long mission has been seen purely as announcement. Because of that one-way traffic in India, without remembering the spaghetti culture, it is dialogical engagement that will make the character <coughs> of mission. Our fresh encounter with Mantra in this context of today demands this move. So we find ourselves, when we use the word world Christianity, and talk about world history, <coughs> we locate ourselves in a different matrix when we do physiology. Thirdly, world Christianity is also a theological matter. If what we have said so far about world Christianity is taken seriously <coughs> into account, our theological task must take a new form. Our theological task we have to make dialogical engagement as a method for theology. Very often method for theology is taught in terms of solitude, being in your study, thinking up, coming up with ways of doing theology. No, it is always in the engagement with the other that theology happens. So community for theology becomes an essential thing because we're talking about world Christianity now. So all our method in theology has to take a dialogical character. Such involvement means both intra-ecclesial conversation and inter-religious conversation. So when we said the word world Christianity came as a combination of world mission and ecumenism. This is what we mean. That you cannot do theology without an intra-ecclesial conversation. Or you should not do it to take world Christianity seriously. It is always in conversation. Even if it's a small conference, why there and I would sit. <laughs> <laughs> Everywhere we need to be in conversation. 
so that we do our theology, our method of theology is through conversation. And I have been blessed to be the student of Gordon Coppen, who in his book, In Face of Mystery, has a chapter on conversation. <coughs> and talks about how theology can never be a monologue, can never be simply debates. It has to be conversation, free, unfettered conversation. So it becomes a method of theology. Not only that, dialogical engagement is not simply a method, it is a source and resource for theological exploration. Today we talk about comparative theology. One of the champions of that is on the other side of the river called Frank Clooney. He writes about it quite a bit. He has two books on comparative theology. Comparative theology literally means that dialogical engagement is not simply a method, it's a source. It informs us. It tells us. We may get some new insights because of our dialogue with our Muslim friend, a dialogue with a Hindu neighbor. Because that engagement is a source for theology. Let's keep the quadrilateral going. Very good monthly school. So John Wesley's quadrilateral <laughs> matters. But let's have a fifth one. Or add to experience dialogical engagement. <clears throat> That experience is a source. So it provides us. Our own uh, Harvard student, John Tatamani, has worked on Paul Tillich and Shankara to talk about how Shankara informs Tillich, how Tillich informs Shankara, how we can come up with a new understanding of sin and salvation interacting with these two people. So that's what happens. And I have the privilege of being part of a group where we did what we call thinking together. People from five different religions, we met for 10 years every year to think together. So our group was called Think Together. And you find some, only some members are here, that's a Buddhist monk from Sri Lanka, and uh, Rita Gross, a Buddhist uh, from uh, Wisconsin, and then you have the lady from uh, uh, United States, uh, a Muslim, and uh, next is Devi, who is the uh, Jewish educator from Israel, who I had the privilege of hosting her in our home in India, and uh, then there's a Sri Lankan, and the two men in the blue shirts are the Hindus, one from Trinidad, another from South Africa, then we have our own Ray uh, from here, Presbyterian, Wesley Ali Raja from Sri Lanka, and me. And we had met several times in one of our meetings here. We're sitting and talking. On the right hand side, you find Debbie, uh, the educator from Israel. Next to her is an Imam from South Africa. We are all together learning from one another. So, dialogical engagement is a source for our thinking. Fourthly, world Christianity is a passport. Why that I mean this? <coughs> Worship life in the church is renewed and revived when there is world Christianity. Yesterday in the chapel we sang a hymn written by Murray from New Zealand. Without that hymn, that service would be impoverished. Look at the Methodist hymn book. There are hymns by Brian Wren, the British hymn writer. And in our own place, Carl writes hymns. And the word Christianity has to become a part of the pastoral practice. Hymns are one example of that. There are rituals, there are practices, the practices of passages of life in different cultures, which may become part of our pastoral practice. So world Christianity revives our worship life. Different parts of the world supply resources, which revives the worship and renews our spirit. 
and also regeneration of congregational life. Take your congregation to a little town in Africa or to India. They are transformed. There is a new energy comes out of people being present in a totally different local expression of Christianity. It gets stuck. So whenever I took students to India, I realized that I don't have to do anything. I just keep them there. Let them sit through the New Year's Eve service, which starts at 11.30, goes on till 2 o'clock. Because all Christians in my town are so keen to receive the New Year sitting inside the church. Yeah. But the pastor will get up at 12 o'clock when the bell is rung and wish them Happy New Year. They're waiting for that. And someone who encounters that cannot come back and have the same congregation life. They're going to be totally transformed and energized in their work. So I would say what Christianity leads two core aspects I talked about, and each of them can be put this way. Well, Christianity gives us the comprehensive history. When I came to Atlanta, I saw there was two courses offered in the history of Christianity. And it started from St. Paul, or actually from Jesus, and went to Augustine. There it went to Karbat, and came to the local theologian maybe a little bit of clinic. So I had to ask them, what is that history of Christianity? Is that all? Then my good colleague said, that's all we know. <laughs> <laughs> you want us to teach something which we don't know? <laughs> then they were gracious to let me come in. Once in that course, in the semester, give one lecture on the theological struggles in the non-Western world. Hmm. Yeah. That's within one back hours I should be able to do it. <laughs> so I always start by saying, <coughs> in the year Immanuel Kant died, 1804, a new village came into being called Nazareth. Do you know, when you are studying Immanuel Kant, there's a little church coming in Nazareth, a comprehensive history of Christianity is what we need. A collaborative missiology. A missiology where we are talking to Hindu missiologists, Muslim missiologists. Mark Haim and his friends are involved in one program at that time. We are doing mission theology together with people of other faiths. What they would see as mission. In light of which, what, how would I define my own theology of mission? So collaborative missionary and comparative theology. We have quite a bit going in our own school, in the writings of Bob Neville, and Wesley Wiseman and others. There's quite a bit going on there. And connection with pastoral theology. How do we connect to different forms of Christianity? Artistic forms of Christianity. We have a court working on that. So in a sense, well Christianity involves all these. And we are called to do that. And what a privilege it is <coughs> to be a participant in this widening movement in theological education. Now my mind is changed. <laughs> <laughs> World Christianity came into theological education through the program of globalization of theological education, especially initiated by the Association of Theological Education in the United States. From 1980, they started that to bring a sort of global dimension to theological education in the United States. And that's how this job, Professor of World Christianity, came into being, at least in places like Atlanta. I rejoiced over that. 
But now we have somebody to tell people the big world is bigger. The World Series or the World Championships in this country do not define the world. <laughs> I made a big mistake when I came first year to Cambridge. I asked people, oh, World Championship? What are the countries playing? <laughs> he said, Milwaukee. <laughs> they may be almost different nations, but today my mind has changed. I'm not rejoicing all that that much. I tell you why. We need to actually look forward to a time when there will be no professors of world history. There should be none. I'll tell you why. Jeremiah said, the days are surely coming when I'll make a new covenant. No longer shall they teach one another, nor say to each other, know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the dead. Our faculties will become so international, you don't need a professor of world Christianity to help you think about world Christianity. It's right there in your faculty. Or, even if that cannot happen, every discipline, every theological teacher would be so imbued with the spirit of world Christianity, that there will be no need for a professor. Mm -hmm. You sit in any class, you experience world Christianity. Mm -hmm. That day is coming, it already is. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs>
as a professor of world history and perhaps. Because I will be teaching systematic theology in my own Indian way. In that way, I am promoting world history. So very often what happens is, we have a separate position for that, which takes it away from, or gives a good excuse to others not to expand. Right. No, every discipline has to be. So if we bring people from outside, we don't bring them under a special category so that we can keep them. No, they should be in part of, if you want a church historian, get a church historian from Africa to come and teach us church history. A New Testament scholar from Japan <laughs> coming and teaching. Not that we bring, or there are positions in some schools, uh, a professor of third world theology. I think that is something separate. No, that third world theologian should be teaching the regular theology class. So that's the change I'm trying to work, which will take some time. I'm, it's uh, no uh, problem to dream ahead. So th uh, time is coming, I said. Uh -huh. It already is, but. So that is the actually yeah. sad part. Without some willingness from the school, some international scholars cannot get in the school system in America to teach. But at the same time, if you, if that is the case, if if you know like uh, you know people from the India or Korea or you know China to teach systematic theology as a systematic theology or constructive theology or and and then yeah we should have more. It, in an idea world, we should have more opportunity, but in a box and in, in reality, that is assigned to only one or two positions for each international scholar. Yeah, so. What we are talking about is the logistics of organizing the curriculum and the theological faculty, which involves a lot more thinking and planning. But what I'm offering is a vision in which we are all so conscious of the worldwide character of the Christian faith that our teaching will never be just one little tradition we know. <laughs> See, for example, ecumenical seminaries have always taught beyond confession. I mean, this is a Methodist school. We are not all the time teaching Methodist theology. We are teaching all kinds of theology. So ecumenism came that way. So in the same manner, world Christianity should pervade our system in such a way that uh, we can all say, uh, I was in Boston, but not simply in Boston. I was in the world. If a student can say that at the end of his or her studies, that's an achievement. And that's not too far from reality. It will happen. It is happening. Yes, sir. I guess my question is, um, I know we're talking a lot about education inside the classroom, but how much of education for us being students and stuff should be, like you said, going somewhere outside of your own context? Do you think that's something that, you know, like Methodist or even, you know, seminary should require? I know that here they have travel seminars, but how much do you think that um, that actually covers an idea of another worldly part of Christianity? Yeah. yeah I mean here we have a variety of schools. I know one school where it is required, a cross-cultural experience is required for getting your MDU, which means in your tuition, there is a bit added so that you have money to travel. Mm -hmm. So all students are required. Now I'm helping uh, the Methodist Steelers in school in Ohio. They bring every two years. Uh, to students to India, and I organize that program. And these students are required to, to go somewhere, and these students chose to come to India. So that there are schools of that kind. Then there are, now we are in a position actually, you don't even have to get out of Boston <coughs> to experience the world. You know, how many of us have visited Korean churches, Chinese churches, the Tamil congregation here, the Martha Church here, the Eastern Orthodox. 
this there's a world here in Boston. <coughs> Thanks to <laughs> changes, information <coughs> technology, we can get to it. So it is possible to organize that. And you are quite right, it's not simply education, it's not simply classroom. It's something let's say hello in the cultural is part of the PLD education. A meeting in the chapel is part of the PLD education. You know. Uh, chapel in theological schools is a very special place. It's a place of learning. You know, because every theology is adoration of God. And where does adoration of God happen? In school. It's in the chapel. So there's a lot that one can do. Yeah. Yes, I'm sure. <clears throat> I was wondering, you talk a lot uh, uh, about the the different, the four different ways you see you define world Christianity, and you've been teaching within a Western theological education system. Can you speak to how you see the the methods or the pedagogy that's used in the West in theological institutions might be changed by a, a world Christianity perspective? No, I started with how my life was living with world Christianity, so. In, when people in India live with world Christianity, they have to look at it with different eyes than what you do. I mean, here it is called globalization. The same process is called contextualization there. I used to tell people, <coughs> since I came from India, I'm doing the same thing. Why the same thing? In India, I was telling my students, it's not enough to read Karbat and Tilik. We should be reading how theologians, Emma Thomas, Stanley Samartha. That's what I was telling my students in India. And I come here, what am I telling my students? It's not enough to read Bhakt and Tilik. <laughs> you should read Sia Song. So, in one sense, they have to be, they have to make a different kind of a move in which they should let go the benchmark character of Western theology and revel in their theology. Own it as their theology. Just like the way I owned Nazareth after I came here. I never owned a Nazareth in India. I own it now. To my people, I want them to own it. It may look Western, it may have a tower like any little church in England, no, it's our. So in that, it's a different kind of movement there. But it's possible. It's possible. And there, the presence of non-Indians on the faculty of my school meant a lot. Because there was a lot of problems with the Indian government getting visa for professors because of their you know, curtailing missionaries and all that. We get to argue for it. Because we said, we can't run this place. Not financially, but we cannot run a good theology school. We're just Indians. We need other. Because there was a plan to transfer money instead of people. <coughs> and we did that too. We could hire an Indian with the money a mission board would spend on sending their missionary. And we said, oh, that's unhelpful. Because money without a face. We need that face. Right on that, so that we know we belong to a much larger church. But it's, it's possible to do that, but it's, it has to come with the appeal for contextualization rather than globalization, I think. <coughs> Peter. Thank you very much for a wonderful lecture. Um, I, I like the way you began with the particularization of Christianity, saying that Christianity is always particularized in a particular context. And that, I think, is the value of uh, traveling to different locations. Because you can, from a distance, look at that church and say, well, they're just like us. <laughs> but then when you go inside the church, you see that it's not just like us, and yet they are worshiping as part of the same uh, religion as we. And, and so it seems to me that 
that both both the Christians in mm -hmm. India need to have greater exposure to the way Christians are elsewhere. And Christians here uh, need to have a similar expansion of their own experience. And you get that by connectedness uh, with someone who's different. And you go there not to look at and to be enamored with what's the same, but you should go to look for what's different and then to try to understand the difference and to, uh, and, and to celebrate yeah. that difference, I think. Uh, yeah. and, and I think you brought this up yeah. beautifully yeah, in just, your lecture. Uh, yeah. Another example would be Indian pastors who come to this country, when they go back, they suddenly realize that there's something called coffee hour. Which <laughs> 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 never happens in India. Exactly, yes, okay, that's mm, good. Never point. happens in India. Exactly. Yeah. Why? People don't come to church for community. People come to church for worship. Yeah. Community they already have. Yeah. Here they don't have, so they go to church for community. So you have to have coffee or so they start in And people begin to see there is a point to it, yeah. I love my community, which is often cash based, unfortunately, and I'm coming into the church to coffee hour. Maybe a good thing. So my congregation, where I'm attending now, they have every now and then coffee hour. Because there's no other way for people to talk to each other. Which is a very Hindu way of doing things. You go to the temple, worship God, go home. Get the prasad, get the blessing and go home. So get the bread and the wine and go home. No, we need one another. So, we have been, so you can see how that learning happens when somebody gets exposed to a different local expression of Christianity. Sure. <coughs> yes, sir. I'm curious about um, your doctoral studies with Gordon Kaufman yeah. and how that uh, influenced your career. Uh, the reason being, I remember reading a review of In Face of Mystery by a post-liberal theologian whose name is escaping me, basically saying that this is a very interesting intellectual enterprise, but um, absolutely useless for real Christian communities and potentially dangerous for them, definitely spiritually indigestible for them, the way that Kaufman is um, uh, radically reimagining traditional symbols. But it sounds like all of your work after working with him was precisely with local uh, emphasizing the local character of Christianity and uh, the vitality of those traditions. So I'm just wondering, what was the influence there? Yeah, you know, Kaufman's journey is a very different journey than mine. So he has a Mennonite, a conscientious of picture to art, peace loving. Uh, he had one journey in which he was so concerned about the viability of the concept of God. The man wrote a book, God the Problem. And we all used to say, God is not the problem. God, what is the problem? <laughs> <laughs> we used to say that. <laughs> and of course, In Face of Mystery was one of his best achievements. Actually, it's interesting. I told him, Gordon, I can now worship the God. Because that book, with all its dryness, with all its scientific stuff, ends with Trinity as the climax of his thinking. But of course, <laughs> Kaufman cannot stop. He went further into, in the beginning, creativity, Jesus and creativity, which kind of almost threw in face of mystery out. Here, mystery was uh, replaced by creativity. So there, there is a problem with God and God. What I learned from him, you know, here was a man who taught me, Thomas, you have to do your own homework. It is your theology. 
you do your theology. It is human imaginative construction. That he taught me. So he gave a big freedom to me. My first paper in the Harvard Doctoral Colloquium was a disaster. Nobody was willing to say anything. Everybody wanted to be nice to an Indian guy who has just arrived. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew it was a disaster. <laughs> I went to Kaufman's office the next week. I opened the conversation with Dr. Kaufman. That was a disaster, wasn't it? He said, yes, Tom. <laughs> You know what he said? Your problem is, you think quoting somebody is an argument. Mm -hmm. That's what the culture I come from. Mm -hmm. If big people have said that, it must be true. So I had to learn, no, I have to argue. I wrote one paper, it was meant for another seminar, four times for you. Every time you would read it and criticize it, I will rewrite it four times a row. That's how it done. So when he got Alzheimer's, uh, we four where his students went to visit him. Uh, we had a con conversation with him. And we sensed that there was a disappointment in him. If I put it crudely, he was kind of worried there were no Kaufmanians. <laughs> there are Bartians. <laughs> there are Tilikians, but there are no Kaufmanians. So he didn't say these words. I could see that's what he was aiming at. So I told him, God, you told me that I have to do my thing and I have to construct on my own. If I listen to you, do you think I will quote you? I will not quote you. That will be authority again. So you have taught me not to go with authority, do my own homework. So that's what you've done. He laughed. I'm glad I told him that. Now, within a year, he developed some complications and died. Mm -hmm. But that's what he got him to do. And he was one who insisted <coughs> that I don't teach in this country. He made me feel guilty all the time. <laughs> he said, you should come back in India. <clears throat> because he saw me working there. Just before coming to Emily, I had organized a conference on systematic theology for a systematic theology teacher. He was the keynote address speaker. And we are sitting there, I get the invitation from Emily. And he said, Thomas, go but don't stay there for long. Mm -hmm. So when I had to stay for long, for the sake of my children, I went and spent a weekend with him, asking him, now, you always told me, now tell me, what should I do? So we had a wonderful conversation on how I could be a theologian from India, working here, and promoting Indian theology in its own way. So he had been a very significant influence in my life. And uh, Wesley Wildman was gracious to put my writing on him. I have a homage to Kaufman. <coughs> he has placed it in his website. So if you go to Wesley Wildman's website, you'll see my homage to Kaufman. That's a great man. <coughs> yes, sir. Um, thank you so much for your very interesting uh, presentation. I learned many things. Um, I'm curious about the interfaith discussion group you were a part of for so long. And that, it just makes me ask several questions. What was that group's mandate? And then the other question would be, what is that group's influence since then? It would have been very interesting to be a fly on the wall and to participate yeah. and to hear these discuss from these different faith viewpoints. My concern is that the people there would represent, you know, faiths that might in their more orthodox expressions, have mutually exclusive mm. uh, uh, statements. And so, what is the group's mandate? And then what, what can their influence be? Yeah, the group's mandate was literally 
thinking together. So I do my theological thinking in the company of other people, in the presence of other people. Because most often uh, theologians have two languages, one in-house language and one language outside. So we may talk all kinds of things bad about Hinduism, but when we meet a Hindu, we say, oh, you're wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, we have two languages. Mm -hmm. Here's a group which doesn't want to have two languages. If we cannot say something in my presence, maybe we shouldn't say it. So that's a kind of one type of mandate. So think together with the hope in that thinking, I would be somehow transformed, influenced by the presence of the other. So the first exercise we had was, what is it uh, that is unique to my tradition? Let's share with each other. Or what is it that I don't want in my tradition? So things of that kind. So we were doing that, then 9-11 came. So it was a big shock to us. So we couldn't meet that year. We felt bad. The next year we met. To simply talk about violence in our tradition. And we had one mandate. None of us will claim that our religion is good, somehow some people have distorted it. We are really done. There must be something in my religion <coughs> that triggers violence. <coughs> Am I ready to see it? So each of us were asked to think about what is it in your religion that might trigger. Mm. So we started with Christianity, bewailing how bad we are, we have done crusades and all of so We have confession after confession by Vesri Ari Raja. Then comes uh, you know, the Muslim, who is also equally doing confession. <laughs> and we have been so bad, you know. Then comes the Hindu, who is also willing to say, yeah, there are some problems. We have some texts which can trigger violence. There are some beliefs which can't be violence. Then comes the Jewish lady from Israel who says, yeah, we were brought out of Egypt, but we are not behaving that way. There's something wrong in the way we went to Canaan, perhaps it's still with us. There's some stories there which can trigger violence. Then comes the Buddhist. So we are all thinking, now this is going to be different. The Buddhist monk is going to get, set up, get up and say, we are all compassion. <laughs> <laughs> You wouldn't believe the Sinhalese, Sri Lankan Buddhists dug up stories within Buddhist tradition that can trigger violence. So that was the kind of mandate. <laughs> so once you listen to all that, then you cannot but correct your theology. You cannot but reconstruct your theology. Because you know there is a dark side to your theology which gets exposed in that conversation. So we've been doing that, and then uh, we did a little bit of publication on that. We have a little booklet called The Faith of the Other, uh, The Face of the Other, because we found that it's often our picture of the other that shapes our theology. So what is the picture of the other we have? Then the latest one, which is being now printed, I think, is on religious conversion. Because that is a big issue, especially in India, uh, should people convert or not. What do we say as people of five different religious traditions about conversion? Because three of them are clearly for conversion. Christianity, Islam, and Buddhism, they go around converting people. They may do it different style, but there is always a mandate to convert. Three traditions. The other two traditions don't care. But now Hindus are trying to imitate us, so they have their mission efforts too. And the Jewish people are dying, so they think we better do something so that we have enough people. So we are all in that process, how do we understand? So we have a book coming soon, I hope, on that, and that was the last uh, picture. We had only 10 years mandate, uh, that's done. But it has shaped each of us. And my Hindu friend just said to me, 
an email yesterday, his new book on Hindu theology of religions. Nobody talks about theology of religions. That's a Christian thing. Yeah. Yeah. Now, a Hindu is writing a book on theology of religions huh. in the Hindu tradition. So something is happening through that. Ultimately, it might you know, help people. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I have a simply complex question for you. It's up to you how you address it or interpret it, but you're done here. You're in the next chapter of your life. What will you do? What are you going to do? You know, the difference between this chapter and the next chapter is only this, that I will not find myself in an MDF classroom. That's the decision I have made. Uh, classroom teaching is over for me. That's the one I have always enjoyed. <coughs> That's my forte in a sense. I love to be in the classroom mm -hmm. teaching. But I have come to a point where I say, oh, that's, that's something I should stop. Stop partly because I am getting a little saturated and I am lazy to update myself anymore. I am done updating all my life. Now it's time to not worry about updating. Mm -hmm. There are too many Christology books coming. <laughs> <laughs> I can't be reading them all. Too many books on mission coming. I cannot be reading them all. If I don't read them, I cannot really teach them. So why torture myself like that? Because I realized in the last two years, when people invite me for a lecture, I go so gladly to the library to turn books and find something and prepare a lecture. That's a different thing than the classroom teaching. Because classroom teaching comes with this whole business of grading, which I hate. <laughs> sort of I always run for a class where I simply teach at the end we all sing doxology and go. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, so I will be lecturing perhaps. Um, so somebody asked me, one of my friends asked me, what, what can we do to get you back here? <laughs> so don't invite me to a classroom. Give me a tour of lectures. I will come and give you a lecture. What I have in my basket, I'll give you. There's not much new in the basket now. It's all good stuff. But Full stop might help somebody. So that I can do. I mean, I'm doing a lot more preaching in my town, in my mother tongue, which I love to do. And I have a slightly bigger project, which I don't know if I'll read. I want a systematic theology volume looked from Tamil perspective, from my mother tongue mm -hmm. perspective. What would it look like if I were to write a book on systematic theology? with Tamil as the base. Mm -hmm. I'll write it in English because I want everybody to read it. But it will be taught through Tamil categories. Mm -hmm. So that's a project I have. And I've been in conversation with Bob Neville about it. He's so encouraging of me to do that. But uh, I'll be less complicated than him, I think. <laughs> Neville is good. Mm -hmm. Getting ultimates. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.